Well, hello and welcome to Easy Peasy Banjo Lesson number four. Now we want to cover today in today's lesson. I want to cover a couple different things, um, and and here's what they are in order. We're going to talk about practice, and uh, I'm going to teach the song "What a Friend We Have in Jesus." In the process, teach a couple new chords. And um, those chords, we'll talk a little bit when I introduce those chords about what can be called accidentals and, and what's the point of having some extra chords when you could do it without them. Uh, it's kind of this idea of melodic chord playing. And it's not difficult, it might sound difficult, but it's really not. If you just learn to add a few in choice places, it helps the song. and. Uh, then um, we'll talk, I'll introduce the idea of capos. Uh, I'm not going to do, spend a lot of time on it. We'll actually, in one of our lessons, as, before we're done, uh, we will actually learn to capo and do songs in a different key by using a capo. A capo is this little piece that goes on the neck that changes the key. And then I have another one that goes up here. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, so, and then um, I also want to talk about how to read a chord diagram. And that'll be how I finish off the lesson. That's a very important uh, skill to have. And if you learn to read chord diagrams, then you can really cause uh, your some growth in your banjo playing. So that's what we're going to do today. So when I talk about practice, what I often tell people is, you know, at least 15 minutes a day. Now, that's not much. But and, and occasionally some people will, who will come back and say, you said 15 minutes a day and I find myself practicing a whole lot more. Well, yeah, I fully expect that if you start to gain ground, you're going to practice more than 15 minutes a day because you're having fun. But I want you to know that with just a small commitment of 15 minutes every day, you will grow tremendously. And, and it's, the, it's the kind of practice you could squeeze in anywhere. Um, it, it, that you could, if you get up a, your early riser and you have extra time, you could do it then. You could do it after dinner um, or after the kids go to bed or just before you go to bed or however you want to slip that in there. But it's just a 15 minute practice and, and commit to doing it every single day. Uh, that's what makes the difference between uh, grow, people who grow in their playing ability and people who don't. And the other thing about that is I understand that you may feel that you don't sound all that great at first. Nobody really does. There's often a lot of clunkety plunkety. Uh, and, and, you know, a friend of mine that had played a lot of good quality three-fingered style bluegrass banjo uh, mentioned that he started out just going kerplunk, 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 and it didn't sound like much. Um, that's, that's how it is, but it will grow. And, and you know, my wife Debbie and got a hold of this 15 minutes a day idea on the guitar and pretty much taught herself to play the guitar in a year. And uh, she's doing really well with it. And, you know, all I really showed her was, here's how to read a chord diagram, here are some songs with chords on them, and, and she worked her way into that. 15 minutes a day, she got where she did a mite more because she enjoyed it. That's what it takes. Now, some of you have noticed, you know, from the day we did lesson number one with How Great Thou Art, you went, hey, I can do this. And that's good news. And if you never go further than that, that's your business. But um, I, my goal is to teach as much as I can and really 10 lessons uh, on playing that, so that you can grow from there. 
And I would challenge you, don't get so stuck with just that, that you don't try some of the new uh, chord positions that I am showing and teaching. It won't seem as easy and natural sometimes, but go ahead and try to work some of that in. The other thing about, about practice is, um, I'm not doing it today, but if we start talking about different types of strum, places that can teach that uh, once you get proficient with your chords uh, which won't be long you you know probably the, the fine one of the finest banjo players in the world today is Bella Fleck with 14 Grammys and he plays the three-fingered style and he, there are some videos of him teaching people how to do the three-fingered style so if you want to learn with finger picks how to do the three-fingered style I would, I would probably get the videos on Bella Fleck and do those, um, or Daring Banjo has some of those. Uh, same same thing with the Frailing Method, Hammer and Claw, Three Point, whatever they like to call it, Drop Thumb. Uh, his wife Abigail Washburn is an amazing musician in her own right, and she also gives lessons on how to do that method. That the three-point method and and then Deering Banjo also has a lot of videos there there are people that are very talented teaching how to work some of those standard strums but for us what I'd say is take your thumb and your finger and play with it you know, we've been strumming with our thumb but you you could practice a little pick thing and just play with picking around with your thumb and finger for practice. I'm not going to be um, doing that right now, but that will help. When I was a boy learning to play guitar, didn't really have a lot of picks or anything like that. And someone back in the day, some old timer taught me how to just kind of do a pick thing with my thumb and forefinger, the two finger method. And I started playing guitar that way. And, and oddly, people thought that was really neat. And, um, and now I still kind of do that. I do a lot with my fingernails on the back, downstroke. And I a lot of times use these two fingers in that. And I do a lot of drop thumb where I, I pick out melodies with my thumb. And, and things like that. Uh, you don't develop that. Uh, mechanically always. I mean, it's good to do that and practice it, but um, as you're practicing, don't be afraid to, to play around with things. The other thing I'd say about practice that's very important is listen to yourself. Uh, make sure you're getting clear tones. When you come up here, make sure you're getting a clear tone and not a lot of buzz, not a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, I've noticed a lot of musicians, uh, guitar players, banjos alike, who um, have been playing for years and are getting a lot of buzz, that kind of stuff, because they're just not pushing hard enough, they're not f getting their finger positioned properly, they're not really paying attention to how the instrument sounds. Um, good musicians listen. They don't just hear, they listen. And the, the more we listen, the cleaner the sound. A uh, wonderful example of that probably is actually a, a jazz trumpet player, Miles Davis. And when he was being taught to play the trumpet, his teacher insisted on good, clear tones over anything else. And that's actually what hit, made him famous as a premier jazz trumpetist was just clear tones. He didn't use as many notes as a lot of guys. He held them out more. They were very distinct and clear and and it became a style that many people wanted to emulate. Uh, clear tones, very important. So that's what I want to say about practice. Just it, some guidelines. 
you know you want to do it all the time but but those are some good steps to consider so now let's talk about what a friend we have in Jesus and I'll do it with what we know and uh, because remember, uh, let me re refresh this. There's our open G chord. There's our barred C chord. There's a barred D chord. And then we learned a G7 down here with this finger right here. And um, let's see, there's our D7. We put a finger here on the se second string, first fret, and uh, the sec third string, second fret those two fingers that's our d7 so we don't have to come all the way up here we could do d7 here so i'll go through the song with those and then i want to show where i want to add a couple chords one's going to be a bar chord and one's going to be a minor chord just to give flavor and it's something extra to practice so for that song but um, we're doing anyhow because I haven't taught you how to use a capo yet so that was the verse and that's kind of how that goes now as we um, will start over um, and and I'll add a couple things and one of the things I want to add the first thing to practice is we've practiced barring at the fifth fret we've practiced barring at the seventh fret so barring at the second fret gives us an A chord, which is a great way to lead into our D7. And that's one of those accidentals that um, doesn't have to be there, but if we kind of use it in a melodic way, it adds some flavor to the D7. And so you could just practice that, go on from your A, and, and then when we'll, you can put that in the song. If you're just playing along and you're not ready to do that, I understand. You can just skip over while I do it and go straight to your D. But as you're developing this, hopefully you'll rewatch these videos as you develop the song. As you're developing it, you need to practice going from your A to your D7. Just like a lot of times you go from a G7 to your C. Then you can go from an A to a D7. And you can kind of hear that it adds a melodic quality to it. So we're going to do that. Now the other chord we're going to learn, and this will be easier once you, at the end when we talk about learning to read chord diagrams, but is an A minor. And so uh, we're going to put a finger here on the second string, uh, first fret with our first finger. Then um, we're going to take the fourth string, second fret, second finger, and then the third finger will be the third string, second fret, and then your pinky can go first string, second fret, and that's an A minor. Now, if you're having trouble with your pinky, a lot of people do it first, their pinky's not very agile, then you can not use your pinky, just don't hit that, that first string down there, because it... It doesn't, you know, even if you do it, you'll get by, but um, that's, that's an A minor. Let's so hear the difference. And, and so you can always not hit that and just kind of strum the first three strings there. Um, and, and I'm going to use those, and I understand you're going to have to work at getting the position, you're going to have to work at being able to change those real fast, things like that. If you have a copy of the song, maybe an old hymnal with the words, and you want to watch the video and write the chords in above the line where you see them on, on uh, the screen, that'll be fine. You know. And, and I'm going to do this. I'm only going to do the first verse 
um, the whole first verse this time to, to show how it's done. And uh, obviously with whatever verse, I usually only just use three verses, but it, there are plenty of verses available and those are easy to find. And if you, if you went and found yourself a three chord hymnal, that got you started. And if you're using something like a three chord hymnal and I'm starting to add chords into that, write them in. Uh, it's okay. And if you're in our church and you've got one of the, the uh, I call them fake books, that one of the gospel fake books that I put together, um, then you'll have those chords and you can just follow. What a friendly heaven, Jesus. Oh, our sins and griefs to That's how that works. Um, practice that. Uh, this would be a great time for me to introduce the idea of um, capos. And, and I might say in, in lessons to come, I might talk a little more about melodic chord arrangement. And why, you know, for instance, you might want to use a D another D down here and then a D7 um, it, it brings more melody into the chord uh, that's something you'll look at once you're comfortable but um, we're gonna talk about capos and then and then right after that uh, I want to talk about how to read a chord diagram and I'm going to show a picture of four chords in a chord diagram which are really the major chords that you're ever going to need in most old time gospel songs and, old, and probably most bluegrass type songs. Well, the first thing we'll talk about is your regular capo. Now, if you're thinking, well, how do I get a capo for my banjo? Uh, go to amazon.com, search banjo capos and, and pick one. Now, this was an old guitar capo I cut off with a hacksaw, actually. But if I'm going to capo it on the uh, <clears throat> second fret. And so I, this particular instrument, I built this instrument. It's, it holds its tune really well. It's, it's set up really well. So it works fine on this to put the capo right in the middle. Of the frets. Now, some instruments you kind of have to get it right up close to the fret because they're getting buzzes and stuff. It's because they're not well adjusted or well designed. This one doesn't even have an adjustable neck. It is still reinforced, but not adjustable. But it just happens to be that everything's set up well. Now, if you'll notice on a five string banjo, once you put that capo there, you got a problem with this string because this is an open G that's supposed to drone when you're in the key of G. It doesn't, it doesn't quite sound right. So you've got to do something uh, because it's zero fret is here. You got to capo it on the second fret of the high string. In a lot of ways that's done. They sell some fancy dandy capos with a long bar that comes up here. I don't like those at all. Uh, they seem cumbersome to me. What I did for uh, many years uh, was I used in, in my instruments. I didn't bring it with me today. Uh, my mountain banjo has them. Uh, what I call, uh, they're called banjo spikes. You can get them from 
during banjo sales, banjo spikes, I think you get 12 for $5. And you drill a little hole and you put the spike in and the string hooks under the spike. And they even have videos on how to do that. Before they were called banjo spikes, they were just model railroad spikes. And that's what I used and I had a small bit and I'd drill a hole and I'd tap that in. And in fact, the banjo my oldest daughter Ashley has that she's playing has banjo spikes and they work really well and I liked them a lot better than the old fashioned capos to be honest with you. And um, you can do that. Um, I'm using a different product uh, on this one because I really don't want holes in my Tiger Wood banjo. And, and I actually think I like this better and I'm going to hold it up. It's a, it's, it's a funny little piece of $15 right there. Um, but you can get that for about $15 on Amazon and it's called a Strum Hollow fifth string capo. So if you remember Strum Hollow and the fifth string, that's what that is. Now you see that that little notch that goes over the string. So we'll come up here. That goes over the string just like that. And it hooks on. And then we can slide it right on up here. And I put it right next to the fret, as close to the fret as I, I like to get it really right there. And then I gently I get it right there. Um, on the fret, not on it, but right next to it, where it's just kind of hanging over it, and I tighten that gently, not hard, just real gentle. And it gives me the tone I need. And it seems like a lot, but it's really not. If you just try it a few times, it gets real easy. And that, that makes things better. So for instance, I'm out of breath, but uh, now I've just raised the key uh, one whole step. And so if I go back to what a friend we have in Jesus, I might not struggle as much. Mm, a friend we have in Jesus. All oh, our sins and griefs to bear. That's how capos work. We'll spend more time on them later. But uh, I'm introducing it because as you're thinking about this, at some point, you're going to need to be able to capo your instrument. Uh, as it's tuned in open G, you're going to be changing keys a lot just by moving capos. And I'll explain what keys you're moving into and we'll learn all that. And uh, in fact, I, years ago, uh, created a capo chart that um, that is widely used uh, you know uh, with people who have received that and uh, I think my wife still uses it quite a bit and uh, I actually did it as part of a mandolin book that I'd put together many years ago but um, the uh, that particular capo chart when I get to the capoing if you say, well, I'd really like a copy of that chart, um, you message the channel and I'll email you a copy. I won't do that until I get to that lesson, but that's coming. So you may want to get out there and look at some capos and buy some. When it comes to the banjo capo, this first part that covers four strings, anything will do. A guitar capo would work, but um, banjo necks are a bit more narrow. And, and so that's that's why you'd look more towards banjo capo. If you're working on a ukulele, banjo capo will work on a ukulele just fine. Uh, and if you're learning to play open string guitar from these lessons, as I've talked about some of those things, and I'm actually going to be doing some lessons on slack key ukulele uh, and some slack key guitar, uh, I'm kind of trying to get 
my 10 banjo lessons done first and then I'll be working on some of those then uh, obviously you just you wouldn't have to worry about a fifth string capo if you're doing guitar or ukulele you just need a capo that you can move up and down now if you want fifth string if your banjo has banjo spikes you're set if it doesn't uh, you can you could go online and read about putting banjo spikes in if you want or for fifteen dollars you could get this strum hollow uh, they make there's another company making a similar type of thing for like sixty dollars fifty nine or sixty dollars I don't remember who they are and and I don't know maybe it's a little better I don't know but it's not that much better for my opinion the nice little device works very easily came in a little velvet bag that you can put your other capo in with and finger picks so I thought it was pretty cool and sounds good so let's work on that now if you'll notice there's a picture up on the screen that I'll, I'll move over so the picture is easier to spot there's a picture um, and and it's it's of some chord diagrams now these four chords are um, essential to uh, banjo playing uh, in the key of G and you'll see the first chord uh, we'll just leave the capo on pretend it's not there the first chord it would well here I'll just take it off it's pretty quick and easy there goes that strum hollow it's off and now off comes the other capo there's our G chord and uh, the next chord they show on the diagram is a C chord now remember we've been playing our C up here next week we'll talk about that chord shape or C down here and what you'll see on there is it it has four strings and it shows it shows the cutout for the fifth which you don't really have to worry about in chording but it shows uh, the four strings and then it's got numbered dots and there's a one two and a three and you'll see that on the C chord and it shows the one the one is this finger two is this finger three is this finger so the one goes there on on the second string first fret they show a two up here on the fourth string second fret and a three on the first string second fret and that's how you know how to use a chord diagram and there's your C chord and the same thing they get down to a D7 and it's just exactly the chord that I showed us um, first fret second string uh, second fret third string there's a D7 and and then uh, it shows an E minor chord which we haven't learned but we're gonna want to know it because it's gonna come up in some songs and so we have the second uh, finger, fourth string, second fret, and the third finger, first string, second fret. Now I want to say something about that. There's a reason behind using those fingers on that chord because um, it's easy to go back to your C by just adding a finger and moving it. it if you're if you go if you make your E minor like that you're moving your hand more than necessary and the idea is to so I can go G G7 C D7 G and and I barely looks like I'm moving my hand in fact I was playing the other day I played a song has a whole bunch of chords in it and a guy thought I was just playing one chord the whole time because I wasn't moving my whole hand. I was just moving a finger here or there. And, and it didn't look like I was moving much. And, and so um, that's, that's helpful. And, and that's how you read the chord diagram. And, and it's all there. Now, if, um, if you don't have access to those chords, and what I'm telling you is those uh, those can be found in any banjo book. They can be found online, anything. They're not hard to discover. But if you're if you're interested and you're having trouble and you're not sure where to look, etc., 
If you message me uh, on this, uh, related to this lesson, if you message me on the YouTube channel with your email address, I will email you a copy of that chord diagram uh, with the G, C, D7, and E minor. And there's a lot of songs, you know. Um, I started to do it, but it's in too low a key, so I'll get back to that song a different time. I, you could do I'll Fly Away um, with just those. You can do Amazing Grace with those chords. Uh, so many. And, and next week we will actually be doing Amazing Grace, and we'll be using a lot of those chords for that. So that's it for this week uh, for Easy Peasy Banjo Lessons. And that's easy peasy lesson number four. And Lord bless you guys. And we'll see you next week.